CSBC. Uh, let me uh, say happy Mother's Day to all of our uh, mothers in the congregation. Uh, the other day I was counting up. We, we now, in, in our regular EM, have 12 mothers, uh, which is really just a praise God. Uh, I know we have uh, more than that today, but for those of you who are visiting, uh, when we first came to the church uh, 13 years ago, there was, uh, in the EM, there was only one, uh, which was uh, uh, my wife. Uh, and so now we have 12. So um, praise God, uh, our, our church continues to expand. It is, it is, it's actually one of the largest ways that we expand is the having children in college uh, because we are we have built a lot of young couples. So praise God for that. Uh, if you have your Bible, uh, if you would open to the Gospel of Mark. Gospel of Mark, uh, this morning we're going to be in chapter 11, uh, verses 15 to 19, and then 27 to 33. Mark 11, 15 to 19, 27 to 33. The title of the sermon this morning <clears throat> is this, House of Prayer or House of Cards. So let's read the text, open this in a word of prayer, and then we'll jump into our sermon. Mark chapter 11, beginning in verse 15. And they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple, and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them, saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. And the chief priests and the scribes heard it and were seeking a way to destroy him, for they feared him, because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. When evening came, they went out of the city. Down in verse 27. They came again to Jerusalem, and as he was walking in the temple, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders came to him, and they said to him, By what authority are you doing these things, or who gave you this authority to do them? Jesus said to them, I will ask you one question. Answer me. And I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? Answer me. They discussed with one another saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, Why did you not believe him? But shall we say from man? They were afraid of the people, for they all held that John was really a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Father, as we get to a story that is filled with a lot of questions, and uh, it's, it's really unlike any other story uh, in the Gospels. Um, God, help us to understand what we want us to learn from these actions of Jesus. It, God, I pray that, that no one here would walk out of this place with a misconception of who Jesus is, that they would not walk out with a belief that Jesus is, is angry or, or uh, uh, that he's an angry Messiah, that he is uh, prone to just fly off the handle and, 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 and start flipping tables and, that that there's something more here that, that clearly you want us to see, God. Help us to see it. Help us to understand why Jesus did these things and what he wants to teach us through them. I pray this in Jesus' name. I want to give the context because the story we get to this morning uh, is really part of a larger context that we started last week. And so if you weren't here last week, uh, let me give the context of, of what's going on right now. And then uh, we'll jump into our exposition, and then we'll get to application. So here's the context. Last week, we saw that Jesus begins to ride into Jerusalem, and crowds gather in front of him, and crowds gather behind him. And they begin to lay their cloaks on the road, their palm branches on the road, as Jesus rides into Jerusalem. They are praising Jesus as the coming Messiah. They see him as the coming Messiah. Once Jesus gets into Jerusalem, the first place and presumably only place that he goes is the temple. He walks inside the temple, looks around, 
And then in an anticlimactic fashion, he leaves. He walks out of the temple, leaves Jerusalem, goes to Bethany, and lodges the night there. On the next morning, he decides to return to Jerusalem. But on the way, he's hungry. And so he looks for something to eat, and he sees in the distance a fig tree that is in leaf. Now, the fact that it's in leaf, he believes maybe it'll be promising that it'll provide him some fruit, some figs. But however, when he gets there, the fig tree proves to be all leaves, no fruit. So consequently, Jesus curses the fig tree. And when he curses it, it withers and it dies. Now, what's the connection here? As I mentioned last week, Mark creates this literary sandwich because he wants us to see a connection between the fig tree and the temple. Just as the fig tree looked promising from the distance, the temple looked beautiful from the outside. If one looked at this fig tree from a distance, it looks promising. If one looked at the temple from a distance, it's a beautiful structure. But upon closer inspection of the fig tree, it proved to bear no fruit. And upon closer inspection of the temple, I think that's what Jesus is doing when he walks into that temple and he looks around. He's inspecting it. And he sees this temple is not producing any fruit. And that's the connection here. And so now I want to look at the, uh, the, the meat, if you will. The fig tree kind of serves as the, 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 the bread that we looked at last week. And now we're going to get to the meat of the story that Mark's literary sandwich. Let's look at verses 15 to 16 of our exposition of the text. They came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. Now, on the day after Palm Sunday, so last week was Palm Sunday, uh, not, not for us, for them, uh, was Palm Sunday, the Monday before Good Friday. So, uh, good, this is the day after what we looked at last week. Jesus returns to Jerusalem, and he once again goes into the temple. Only this time, when he walks into the temple, he doesn't just look around. Jesus, when he goes into the temple, he does something very unique that um, perplexes us. He goes over to these tables where there's money changers, and he flips them. Several, spilling out all the coins on the ground. And he begins driving out people who are buying and selling. So many questions here. So many questions. What is going on here? Who are those selling? Who are those buying? What are they selling? What are they buying? Why does Jesus drive them out? Who are the money changers? Why does he overturn their tables? There are so many questions here. And so let's try to answer these questions so we know what's going on. First, what exactly is going on here? The verb for drive out is a forceful term in Greek. It's often used to refer to casting out demons. That's how forceful of a term it is. That when it says that Jesus drove them out, it's not like he just said, going to leave. He drove them out. In John's Gospel, it says that Jesus went and made a whip of cords and started whipping the animals to, to, to leave and whipping perhaps people too if they wouldn't leave. Not only did he drive them out, but he overturned their money tables, spilling all their coins on the ground. So what is this? Who are these people selling and buying? What are they selling and buying? Why does he drive them out? Who are the money changers? Why does he overturn their tables? There are actually two or at least two primary interpretations of the story. Two primary interpretations of the story. Both have merit. I'm going to call them the purify interpretation and the abolish interpretation. Now that, that's my label. No, I've not seen anybody else label those, those, those ways. That's my label. Purify interpretation and abolish interpretation. Here they are. I'm going to start with the purify interpretation. Here's what is going on if we go with this interpretation. Because this is Passover, the Jews from all the surrounding regions, once a year during Passover, they would all travel to Jerusalem. The Jews lived all over the, the Holy Land. But once a year during Passover, they would travel to Jerusalem to worship and to offer sacrifices. 
Now, the problem is, is they don't have U-Hauls to transport their animals. All right? If you lived far away from Jerusalem, it would be difficult to bring a live sacrifice this great distance away. So the Jews decided to remedy this problem. They would sell animals in Jerusalem. So you could just get there and buy your animal there to make your sacrifice. Now, initially, the market to buy these animals was held outside the temple in the Kidron Valley. But by the time of Jesus, that market of buying and selling animals had moved inside the temple, most likely in the Gentile courts. The, the Jews also required every Jewish male over the age of 20 to pay a temple tax. Pay a temple tax. Now, the tax had to be paid in uh, Tyrian coinage, which, because of its high purity, uh, uh, purity of its silver. But often those who were traveling, they wouldn't have this kind of currency. They would have Roman currency or Greek currency. They wouldn't have Tyrian currency. So again, the Jews decided to remedy this problem. Money changers would set up tables in the temple to convert the Greek and Roman currency into Tyrian currency so that they could then pay their temple tax. And they would even charge a small nominal transaction fee for it. As D.A. Carson writes, instead of solemn dignity and the murmur of prayer, there is the bellowing of cattle and the bleeding of sheep. Instead of brokenness and contrition, holy adoration and prolonged petition, there is noisy commerce. In other words, this looks more like a marketplace. This looks more like a business setting than it does the house of God. And so Jesus drives out the animals, telling them he overturns their money changers' tables and spilling all their coins on the ground because that's not what the temple that's the purify interpretation. The abolish interpretation, which is a, a, it has merit, is that Jesus is not seeking to purify or cleanse the temple at all. That's actually not what he's doing at all. But as a prophet, Jesus as a prophet, he demonstrates his prophecy. That's what prophets often did this. You have like Ezekiel lying on the side and so forth. Prophets would often demonstrate their prophecy. And what Jesus is doing here is he is giving a foreshadowing of what he said he would later do. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. In other words, what Jesus is doing is he's beginning to show everybody that the temple will no longer be the means by which they will draw near to God. In other words, uh, Mark, Jesus wants them to see that it's not that he's there's anything wrong with the selling of these animals and, and, and the, the money exchange. What Jesus' problem is, is that he wants them to say, this temple is no longer going to function this way. Now, Mark includes a detail in verse 16 that no other gospel writer includes, which may actually give credence to the abolished interpretation. Look at verse 16. It says that Jesus would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. Mark's the only gospel writer that includes that detail. What does that mean? It's quite debatable as to what that means. But it may imply that Jesus is stopping them from transporting items in and out of the temple. Things like the showbread, oil for the lamps, incense censers used in sacrifice, sacrificial service. If you read the Old Testament, they had to transport all these different items for the temple to function properly. And Jesus is preventing them from carrying these items through. And so what Jesus is doing is, he, again, he is a prophet trying to demonstrate to them that, that you will no longer use this temple this way. Because I will be the temple. Now, which of those two interpretations is correct? I don't know. I don't know. I find both verified. I find both to have merit. I think both are true. So you be the judge as to how you want to interpret what Jesus is doing here. But I like both theories. I like both interpretations. Let's look at verse 17. And he was teaching them and saying to them, 
Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a den of robbers? So, when Jesus says, Is it not written, he's clearly quoting from the Old Testament. And he's quoting from Isaiah 56 7, where Isaiah says, For my house shall be called a uh, where God says through Isaiah, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. Not a house of business. Not a house of exchange. But a house of prayer. And notice for who? For all the nations. In Isaiah, it's all the peoples. Everybody. James R. Edwards, who's a commentator, writes this. The Messiah was popularly expected to purge Jerusalem and the temple of Gentiles, aliens, and foreigners. Jesus' actions, however, is exactly the reverse. He does not clear the temple of Gentiles, but for them. In other words, what Edwards is saying is that the Gentiles were relegated to the... the somebody's making the quote up. Uh, the, the, the Gentiles were relegated to the the outer courts. They were not allowed to enter the, the inner courts. And so the Jews just said, well, hey, let's use these courts to sell animals and to do money exchange. And, and people thought that the Messiah was coming and he would clear out these Gentiles. He would clear out these foreigners and these aliens. And Edwards is saying, that's not what Jesus is doing at all. Jesus is making it clear that his temple is meant to be for all. That, that God's heart for the nations, God's heart for the Gentiles, could be seen all the way back in the Old Testament. But Jesus says, you have made it a den of robbers. What does that mean? A den of robbers? The only other time that phrase is used is Jeremiah 7.11. That's the only, the only two times that phrase is used is Jeremiah 7.11 in here. And here's, here's what it says in Jeremiah 7.11. Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, I myself have seen it, declares the Lord. Now I want to be clear here. Because when we read that, um, the emphasis can be on the word robbers here. And I don't think the emphasis is on the word robbers. I think the emphasis is on the word den. Here's what I mean by this. I don't think Jesus calls it a den of robbers because they were robbing the people. Though that's certainly true, they probably were robbing them. Even if nothing else, paying them a nominal tax fee, which should not be missing. I think he calls it a den of robbers. And this is many, this is what most scholars or respected scholars would say. Because the Jews think of the temple as their hiding place. They think of the temple as a place that makes them safe and secure. I'll talk more about this again in the application. But the Jews believe that just as robbers would go to their den to hide out, and now they're safe and they're secure in this den, the Jews were treating the temple as though I can go to the temple and I can be safe and I can be secure. But then Jesus shows up to their den and he exposes their sin. I think that's what, what's going on here. Let's look at verse 18 to 19. And the chief priests and the scribes heard it and were seeking a way to destroy him, for they feared him, because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. And when evening came, they went out of the city. <clears throat> so the chief priests and the scribes, they hear about what Jesus does. They hear that Jesus went to the temple, overturned their tables, drove out people, and they begin to plot a way to destroy him. Notice, not just kill him, destroy him. They don't want to just kill him. They want to wipe his memory from the face of the earth. But they don't know how to do it. They're like, look, we've got to be very calculated about this because they fear the people. They fear him. Why do they fear him? Because all the crowds were astonished at his teaching. All the crowds held Jesus to be a prophet. And keep in mind, what do the chief priests and the scribes desire most? What do they desire most? Praise of man. They love to be praised by man, and so they are afraid that, look, if we kill Jesus, they may turn on us. So we've got to be very careful here. That evening, Jesus and the disciples, once again, they leave Jerusalem. 
And we will look at verses 22 to 25 next week, so I'm not skipping over that. I'll get to it next week. But I want to include verses 27 to 33 because they, those verses tie in with our story this morning. Look at verses 27 and 28. And they came again to Jerusalem, and as he was walking in the temple, the chief priests and the scribes and elders came to him. And they said to him, By what authority are you doing these things? Or who gave you the authority to do this? So presumably the next day, Jesus comes again to Jerusalem, and he goes back to the temple. And he's walking in the temple, and the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders, they all come to Jesus. All three groups, all three main groups of the Jews come to Jesus. They brought the big guns. And they want to know, on what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you authority to overturn these tables, spill out these coins, drive out these animals, drive out these people? Who gave you this authority? That's an interesting question, isn't it? What's implied in that question? The implied in that question is that there is an authority above Jesus. It's like if somebody comes to me and, you know, says, uh, I go walk in my pantry and I eat a donut. Somebody says, who gave you authority to do this? Nobody. I did. I live here. It's my pantry. I bought the donut. <laughs> when they say, who gave us authority? It's implied that there's an authority above Jesus. Now, we might expect Jesus to say, by my Father's authority. By my Father's authority. But Jesus was rarely this simple, rarely this straightforward. Look at what he says. Look at verse 29 to 30. Jesus said to them, I will ask you one question. Answer me. And I will tell you about what authority I do these things. Here's the question. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? Answer me. Don't you love it when someone asks Jesus a question? And the way that Jesus answers the question is by asking them a question back. I love when Jesus does this. He uses this tactic frequently. Jesus says to them, listen, I'll make a deal with you. I'll make a deal. Here's the deal. I'll ask you a question. And if you answer my question, I'll answer your question. Deal. Because they sounds like a fair deal to me. They're like, that's good. All right, all right, ask us. What's the question? Was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? He's essentially asking them, was John a prophet of God? Which would be interesting because John said that Jesus was the Lamb of God. So if he's a prophet of God, Jesus is the Lamb of God. Or was John a false prophet? Was John a prophet of God or is John a false prophet? This is a brilliant move by Jesus. Brilliant move by Jesus. Look at verse 31 and 33. And they discussed with one another saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, Why then did you not believe him? But shall we say from man? For they were afraid of the people. For they held that John was really a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We do not know. And Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you about what authority I have. You get the sense that after Jesus asked this question, they're like, they tell Jesus, all right, give us a moment. All right, guys, huddle up, huddle up. All right. It looks like something out of like Monty Python or something. Right? They're like, all right, brothers, brothers, we have two options. All right, heaven or man. What do you think? One guy quickly points out, from heaven. Whoa, 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 whoa. If we say from heaven, he will say, why did you not believe him? Okay, then man. But someone says, well, shall we say from man? They turn around and look at each other and they, they're all thinking the same thing. says that they said, listen, if we say from man, they're all going to stone us. Because all the people are convinced that John is a prophet. So they're stuck. 
So they return to Jesus and they say, we don't know. I wonder how many times did the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes say the words, we don't know. That Jesus asked for A or B, heaven or man. C is not an option. We do not know is not an option. And so Jesus says, then neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. That was part of the deal. The deal was, you answer my question, I'll answer yours. You didn't answer my question. We don't, we don't know is not an answer. So I won't tell you either. Stop there. Application of the text. What do we do with this? I have seven points of application. Seven points of application. Number one. It's a question. So what about that coffee shop in the church? So what about that coffee shop in the church? Let me be clear, the church is not the same as the temple in the Old Testament. Let's be clear about this. This, what we're doing right now, is not the same as the temple in the Old Testament. This is not where we go, where we have to go to meet with God. You can meet with God in your home. This is not where we go to make sacrifices to be right with God. No one is here making a sacrifice to be right with God. I think it's important that we make that distinction. However, the church is the bride of Christ. We are the bride of Christ. And it is the gathering of those who have the Spirit of God inside of them. Not only are we individually the temple of the living God, I am the temple of the living God. If you have the Spirit of Christ in you, you are the temple of the living God. Not only is that true individually, it's also true corporately as well. Collectively, we are the temple of the living God which is important because that raises an enormous question that often does not get asked. What is appropriate in a church and what is not? Often churches don't ask this question. They just think whatever we want to do is appropriate. What is appropriate in a church and what is not? Is a church having a coffee shop where they sell lattes and cappuccinos tantamount to what Jesus is doing, what Jesus has a problem with the Jews doing in the temple? Is a church, rather than selling animals, but selling lattes, the same thing? Or what about a bookstore in a church where they sell Christian books? Jesus said, do not make my father's house a house of trade. The question is, does selling coffee or selling books or selling Girl Scout cookies make it a house of trade? I'm not sure that we can be dogmatic here. I'm not sure that we can be dogmatic because I don't think that the issue is primarily the making of money. I don't think the issue is primarily the making of money. In other words, some will say this. Some, if this debate were to come up, some will say the solution to this is, okay, let's just not, let's just not sell the coffee. Let's just give it away. Right? If, if the issue is, is the, the buying and selling of things, then let's just not charge. But then the question that still leaves the question of, should a church have a coffee bar at all? Now, that question is really a subset of a much larger question. It's a subset of a much larger question, and it is this. Here is the primary question that we need to be asking. How can we create an atmosphere of reverence in a church? How can we create an atmosphere of reverence in a church? And what, if anything, distracts from that reverence? What, if anything, distracts from it? Now, this question entails all kinds of things, such as movies. Is it appropriate to show movies, games, theatrical productions, concert-like sets, political rallies, and so on? You see, the question that every church has to ask itself is this. 
Do we look more like a business than a church? That's the question. Or do we look more like a coffee shop or a concert or a movie theater or a community center or a game room or a political convention than a church? That's the question we need to ask. I can't answer that for you, but every church has to ask that question. What is appropriate in a church and what is not? Number two, we are not given permission to overturn tables, but we are given permission to overturn our indifference to sin. We are not given permission to overturn tables, but we are given permission to overturn our indifference to sin. Remember the fad, what would Jesus do? Y'all remember that? I guess some people maybe still wear those bracelets or something. Uh, Implied in that statement, what would Jesus, what's implied in that statement? Implied in that statement is that whatever Jesus would do in any situation is what we should do. Whatever Jesus would do in any situation is what we should do. I think as a general rule, that's a good standard to live by. As a general rule, that's a good standard to live by. But it has limitations. It has limitations. For example, what would Jesus do? Well, he would go die on a cross for the sins of the world. We are to pick up, spiritually pick up our cross, but we dare not go die on a cross for the sins of the world. What would Jesus do? Well, he would raise the dead. We must be cautious not to think that we can raise the dead simply because that's what Jesus did. What would Jesus do? Jesus would let the crowds praise him. He got on a donkey, rode in, and he let the crowds praise him, saying, Hosanna in the highest. We we dare not let the crowds praise us. So what would Jesus do? Jesus would walk into the temple, overturn the money changers' tables, and drive out those buying and selling. We are not given permission to do that either. Meaning, we are not given permission to go into church, and if we see our brother or sister next to us scrolling on their phone during the sermon, checking scores, checking Facebook, slap it out of their hand. Get that out of here. If we see someone recruiting clients, for their insurance business during the greeting time. We make a cord of, a whip of cords. We drive them out of the sanctuary. Or if the praise team is on a seven minute guitar solo, we go and smash the guitar. Because it turned into a performance. You see, Jesus can do these things Because he's Jesus. He has the authority to do these things. We do not. We do not have the authority to do these kinds of things in the church. So then what are we to take away from this? What are we to take away from from what Jesus does here in these drafts? Here's what I would say. Here's the way I would put it. We are not given permission to overturn tables, but we are given permission to overturn our indifference to sin. In other words, just because we have the authority, we do not have the authority to overturn tables, does not mean that we simply put up with the status quo. That we just accept the church culture. That if if, if there is a sinful church culture in anything, that we accept the small group culture. That we accept our family culture. That when you look at our church and you see, and like, well, that's just CSBC culture. Or that's just living water culture. Or that's just this church's culture. Or you go to a small group. Well, that's just, that's just a small group culture. That's just the culture of this small group. Or at your home. Well, that's just my home's culture. That's just the culture of our home, right? It does not mean that we accept the status quo and we do nothing about it. No. In other words, if you're going to overturn something, overturn your indifference to sin. If you see something wrong, go and do something about it. Go and say something about it. 
Don't accept the status quo. Not in your home, not in your small group, not in the church. Don't just accept the status quo. Something's wrong, do something, say something. I can't tell you what. But if you're going to overturn something, overturn our indifference to sin. Three, make sure your house of prayer is not a house of cards. Make sure your house of prayer is not a house of cards. Jesus quoted Isaiah 56, 7, where God says, my house shall be called a house of prayer. That's interesting to me. He doesn't say a house of worship, though that's certainly true. He doesn't say a house of fellowship or a house of serving or a house of teaching, though those are all certainly true. He says a house of prayer. Why? Why prayer? Why in the Old Testament did God say, my house shall be called a house of prayer? Out of everything he could put in that blank, why prayer? Because do you know what a church is that doesn't pray? It's a house of cards. A church that doesn't pray is a house of cards. In other words, before we become a house of worship, before we become a house of serving, before we become a house of teaching, we must be a house of prayer. Must be. That undergirds everything we do. If we are not a house of prayer, then it doesn't matter how good the worship is, how good the teaching is, how good the serving is, how good the evangelism is. If we're not a house of prayer, it is a house of cards. Leonard Ravenhill, in his book, Why Revival Tarries, that was a book that had a large impact on my life. Leonard Ravenhill writes this in his book, Why Revival Tarries. No man or woman is greater than his prayer life. No man is greater than his prayer life. The pastor who is not praying is playing. The people who are not praying are straying. We have many organizers, but few agonizers. Many players and payers, few prayers. Many singers, few clingers. Lots of pastors, few wrestlers. Many fears, few tears. Much fashion, little passion. Many interferers, few intercessors. Many writers, but few fighters. Failing here, we fail everywhere. You see, we have a choice. We can either be a house of prayer or we can be a house of cards. Let me be clear, guys, that, that's not just true at church. That's also true in your personal homes as well. Is your home a house of prayer? You know what I realized? Um, and you all know this. Uh, I'm not saying anything we don't know. You know what I realized is that much of the scrolling that we do on our phones is simply to fill time, isn't it? Like you're at a long red light. You, know, you take a, a normal route and you know that this light is really long. So you get to this red light. You're hoping you catch it, but you don't. You stop. You're first in line. You're going to be there for a while. What do you do? Pull out your phone. You're in a long line at the post office or the store. What do we do? Pull out our phone. You're in an airplane waiting for it to taxi to the tarmac. What do we do? We pull out our phone. Now, we all do this, myself included. What if instead of pulling out our phone every single time, what if even half the time, what if even one-fourth of the time, we use that time instead to pray? I don't want this house. I don't want this house. I don't want this house to be a house of cards. I want it to be a house of prayer. I want all of these houses to be a house of prayer. Four. Jesus holds open the front door to eunuchs, 
foreigners, Gentiles, women, and lepers. Jesus holds open the front door to eunuchs, foreigners, Gentiles, women, and lepers. When Jesus quoted Isaiah, he says, my house will be called a house of prayer. For who? For who? For all the nations, all the peoples. Now we know in the Old Testament that several people, they were not able to draw near to God in the temple. Only a very select few were able to draw near to God. Eunuchs, eunuchs could not draw near to God. Deuteronomy 23.1, no one whose testicles are crushed or whose male organ is cut off shall enter the assembly of the Lord. Foreigners could not draw near to God. No Ammonite or Moabite may enter the assembly of the Lord. Women could not draw near to God during their menstruation or after giving birth. Leviticus 15. Lepers could not draw near to God. King Uzziah was a leper to the day of his death. Being a leper, he lived in a separate house, for he was excluded from the house of the Lord. 2 Chronicles 26, 21. The Jews even had a specific court for the Gentiles, where Gentiles could come into the temple, but not really into the temple. They were relegated to the outer courts, which is probably where these animals are being sold and where these money changers set up their exchange. I think the abolish interpretation is very attractive because it fits with the narrative of what Jesus is doing with the temple. Just as, because see, Jesus will not, he'll have one more act of desecration to the temple. You guys remember what the last act of desecration of the temple is? He will rip the veil in two when he dies on the cross. Now the verse that Jesus quotes in Isaiah 56 And and why Jesus is clearly showing here that he wants the temple to be seen as not just a temple for a select few, but for all peoples, is because in Isaiah 56, if you go back in your own time, read that at home. In Isaiah 56, it's a beautiful passage. Here's what God says in Isaiah 56. Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, the Lord will surely separate me from his people. And let not the eunuch say, behold, I am a dry tree. God says, I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. The foreigners who join themselves to the Lord, these I will bring to my holy mountain and I will make them joyful in my house of prayer. You see, Jesus doesn't just put up a welcome sign. He holds open the front door for all of us. No matter who you are, what your background is, how stained you are, no matter who you are, Jesus holds open the front door for you if you are willing to come to him. Five. I I, I have seven of these. Sorry, I didn't mention that earlier. Five. There is only one refuge where we are safe, and it is not the church, but Christ. There is only one refuge where we are safe, and it is not the church, but Christ. You know, the fact that Jesus uses this specific phrase, den of robbers, and it's only used one time else other than here in Scripture, tells me that Jesus has Jeremiah 7.11 in mind. I think Jesus absolutely has Jeremiah 7.11 in mind. I was looking up commentaries on Jeremiah 7 11 because I wanted to understand why does he call it a den of robbers? What is the meaning there? And I came across an interesting explanation. John Thompson, who's a phenomenal uh, commentator, on Jeremiah, here's what he writes. And yet the language is is, is, uh, a little hard, but bear with me. Robbers and bandits who sally forth for robbery and plunder secure for themselves a hideout in some secluded area to which they retire for protection and safety away from the eyes of the authorities until the hue and cry dies down, only to issue forth again when the pursuit ceases to commit fresh robberies. Yahweh's people too are lawbreakers, i.e. covenant breakers. Their misdeeds merit divine judgment. 
They flee to the temple for protection, thinking to be safe there, believing that participation in the formal rituals of the cult would somehow deliver them from the judge. But the temple was no shelter place for covenant breakers. There was no security there from the searching eyes of Yahweh. Yahweh declares, I myself have seen. See, in other words, what, what John Thompson is saying here is that the Jews at the time, they were living like the world. They're living just like the world. But they consider themselves safe from God. Why? Because they're in the temple making sacrifices. They're living like the world, but they feel safe inside the temple because they're in the temple making sacrifices. Now, how does that apply to us? You know, as a pastor, you see many come in and out of the church through the years, through the decades. I want to be very clear. Make sure you hear this. I want to be very, very clear. We are deeply grateful for everyone who comes through these doors. Deeply grateful for everyone. All of you and anybody else who comes through these doors, we are always so grateful. But the reality is there are many who come through the doors who do not love Christ. Many come through the doors religiously, week after week after week, who do not love Christ. You wonder why. We're always grateful, always. But I wonder, sometimes I wonder, why are they there? Why are they here? There are many answers to that question. There are many answers, but one answer is this. They feel a sense of safety. They feel a sense of security being in the church. Like the fig tree, they feel safe because the fig tree exists in the vineyard. They feel safe because the fig tree is producing leaves. Now, I don't know if anybody falls into that category in this room. I don't. I don't know if anybody, if any of you fall into this category. But if any of you do, if any of you do, let me say with all the love in my heart, and let me say as humbly as I can say to you, we cannot offer you any protection. None. These four walls cannot offer you any protection. This sermon cannot offer you any protection. These songs cannot offer you any protection. The offering bag cannot offer you any protection. There is only one who can offer you protection from a holy and righteous judge, and his name is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. If you feel safe and secure because you're here and you're here every week, we cannot offer you any protection at all. None. But Jesus Christ offers eternal protection from a holy and righteous judge. Six, Jesus has been given all authority in heaven and earth to overturn our life. Jesus has been given all authority in heaven and in earth to overturn our life. You know, it's not every day that a man walks into the temple and begins overturning the money changers tables, pouring out all the coins, driving out all the buyers and sellers, driving out the animals, preventing anybody from carrying things through the merchandise through it. That's not every day. That doesn't happen every day. And so understandably, the religious leaders come to Jesus. They want to know. We want to know who gave you this authority. I find that people today are still asking God the same question. Who gave you this authority? People today are still asking God the same question. Who gave you this authority? Who gave you the authority to tell me who I can and can't marry? 
Who gave you the authority to tell me that I have to wait until I get married to consummate this relationship? Who gave you the authority to tell me that I can't play video games this long or gamble with my savings or watch this movie or drink this drink or smoke that J or travel this much? Who gave you the authority to tell me this? Now, Jesus didn't answer the religious leader's questions. You know, he didn't, he didn't answer them but he does answer it for us. Right before he leaves this earth, he tells his disciples, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me by my father. My father gave me this authority, which means Jesus has all authority all, all authority on heaven and on earth to come into our life and overturn our life. He rides into our house, walks into our room, and he overturns our life. And he has full authority to do it. And rather than question it, rather than look at him and say to him, who gave you this authority? Who gave you the authority to smash this? Who gave you the authority to pour this out? Who gave you the authority to end this relationship? Who gave you, rather than say that to him, what a beautiful posture it would be to say to the Lord, Lord, if I have set up any sinful tables in my life, any, Lord, Come, come and overturn them. Lord, if there are any more sinful tables in my life, come and overturn them. Seven, last point. Jesus' questions have a way of peeling back all pretense and exposing our heart. Jesus' questions have a way of peeling back all pretense and exposing our heart. Jesus asked the question, Was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? You know what's interesting is that the religious leaders, when they said we didn't know, uh, that wasn't wasn't the truth. The religious leaders did not believe that John's baptism was from heaven. They believed it was from man. The question is, why didn't they just say that? Why didn't they go back to, you know, like, I know they're, they're fearful of the people, but like, why don't they just say that? Well, it's from man. Because they're afraid. Why are they afraid? They're afraid because as John writes, they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. John 12, 43. Jesus knew this. He knew it. And he exposed it. That's why he asked the question he did. And asking this question, he exposed their love of the praise of man. You see, Jesus' questions have a way of peeling back our heart and exposing it, peeling back all pretense, peeling back all masks. And I have a way of peeling it back and exposing what's really there. I was looking up to see if there was a list of all of Jesus's questions. You can Google it and find various lists. There's around 150, 150 different questions Jesus asked in the gospels. One of the features that I have found helpful um, when I read through the Gospels, in your own quiet time, when you read through the Gospels, one of the things I've, I found so helpful is this. When I come across a question that Jesus asked, do I sit there and allow this question to be asked directly to me? And do I allow it to peel back the layers of my heart? To expose my heart? Which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? Why do you see that speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own? Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Do you believe that I can do this? Why did you doubt? Does this offend you? Do you love me? 
You see, I don't want to be like the religious leaders that when I come across these questions by Jesus, that I say to him, I don't know. I don't know. Why did you doubt? I don't know. Brothers and sisters, allow Jesus' questions to peel back the layers of your heart and to expose what is there. That's what they're intended to do.